I recently played in the highest buy-in PLO tournament of all time, and I didn't make the final table, but Jared Blesnick did, and while he was there, he made a pretty bold statement. By the way, for the record, I don't care if I win this or I don't win this. There's no one better than me in this game. There's, there's, there's no one. I don't care if I win this tournament or not. I care, but I'm still the best in the world. So is Jared the best in the world, and how does he fare at this final table competing for 1.3 million? Let's dive into some hands and find out. Let's start with the hand that prompted that comment from Jared. He is on the button with King Jack four deuce, double suited, raises it up, which is relatively standard, and he gets called by Ike in the big blind. They head to the eight, six, five flop with two diamonds, which gives both players a strong flush draw and a weak gut shot straight draw. Yeah, and Ike decides to lead into Blesnik on this one. Kind of makes sense to me. It's a board that's gonna be better for Ike's defending range than it is for Blesnik's opening range, and he also has the nut flush draw and a, a small gutter. Blesnik in an interesting spot here. And he's gonna find out where he's at by raising. Those are 25,000 each. Ike is first to act and he leads out for 170K. Jared with the second nut flush draw and the weak gut shot, he's in very bad shape here. He decides to raise to 500K and this is a spot where I believe the standard play would be just to call. I think most players would just call. Jared decides that he wants to play this hand more aggressively, take control of the pot now. Ike is going to be leading a very wide range on this 865 flop, which is not supposed to hit Jared Blesnick's range as hard as Ike Haxton's. It's a spot where if Ike gets too carried away, um, Blesnick can pick up the pot very frequently now on the flop or on a future street with a raise. Normally with this second nut flush draw, you want to keep in weaker flush draws and not raise and then isolate yourself against stronger flush draws, which as we can see Ike actually has here. But I do understand it, and I think there's some merit behind his play. Playing these spots too passively allows your opponent to push you around. So, uh, interesting play from Jared, and let's see how it works out. Let's what does Ike put Jared on at this point? Jared could have a lot of different things, and that's why Jared's so tough to play against. For value, it would it would just be straights or combinations, Seven, like something like a set with a flush draw. Ike's just getting too good of a price, I think. He's going to call this, at least. I guess the question I was asking you is because if you think that you're up against those straights, then the four deuce is kind of worthless. You're basically just playing this right. as a naked flush draw. Right, but again, Jared did raise less than pot, so Ike priced in to continue, even if he thinks he's only just drawing to the net flush. One of the bigger, po bigger pots we've seen throughout this tournament, 1.24 million. A diamond would make things extremely interesting. Oh, the board pairs. Could Blesnick go one more shot here? Well, this is an interesting card because with neither player having any sort of board pair in their hand, it could freeze the action a little bit, both being concerned that the other player might have a lot of full houses in range. Ike makes the call, as we'd expect, and they head to the five of clubs turn. Ike has an option to lead here with some hands. His hand is a reasonable leading candidate, but he does decide to check uh, entirely reasonable as well. Axton checks over to Bluznik. Oh, this is fascinating. Kind of, I was kind of hoping nothing came out because I wanted to see what they would do. Here's the deal to save time. That means he's used his 30 seconds, but he's got plenty of time extensions. Yeah, and a good spot to be thinking long and hard about what he wants to do here. And 450,000 back over to Haxton. This pot's now 1.7 million. Yeah, and really tough spot for Haxton now to continue because he could be drawing dead. He's out of position. Blesnik fires out a bluff of 450k. Relatively small compared to the pot, but stacks are relatively shallow. We're deep in a tournament. And that's another element of this that makes it so interesting. Ike has Blesnik covered, and Jared should be feeling some ICM pressure in this situation, which should make him play more passively. He shouldn't be looking to build really big pots. And so Ike has to weigh that in his mind. Is Jared really getting out of line here when ICM is such a big consideration? I like this turn bet from Jared. While the flop play is not super standard, this turn bet is relatively standard. You bet the small sizing to continue leveraging your straights while also being protected by your full houses that you raise the flop with. And he's gonna let it go, wow. Wow. That is, that is a fun poker hand. <laughs> Ike in a very uncomfortable spot here with no pair, decides to lay it down and Jared picks up this pot with only 15% equity. I don't, by the way, for the record, I don't care if I win this or I don't win this. There's no one better than me in this game. Unfortunately for Ike, he didn't know at the time that Jared actually doesn't care much about ICM. I thought you said you'd never learned anything, but you know about ICM? I, I don't even know what it stands for, but I know what it means. How about that? I, I don't know what it stands for, I know what it means. Actually not caring about ICM and having your opponents know that 
gives you an edge in an odd way where ICM is essentially a game of chicken and you've told them, I'm not going to swerve, so you need to get out of my way first. I, I don't know what it stands for, I know what it means. Oh, you learned but something. But I'm telling you, I don't, I don't give two fucks about doing it. Okay. And, and, and the jump. In that case, I'll fold. <laughs> By the way, I've played a lot with Jared, and he certainly keeps things interesting, both with his play and his antics. Hold on, hold on, this is exciting. We're opening up the panini box. Ah. What are we getting? Each one of these boxes is $1,000. Sounds you. like a bad deal. There's two cards in that panini one box, two really basketball cards, item. and that box goes for $1,000. Probably not feeling great after making that call. He's been amazing. This looks he like he's he's found his all-in hand. Yeah, the 26-year-old is absolutely. I can use. I'm gonna open up a box. I think I'm gonna use a few time extension. That's legal, right? <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> Wait, by the way, he's doing this while Kempton is all in. Yeah. D'Angelo Russell. Doing this in the middle of play. Right. While Kempton, by the way, is all in before he's not even. 000. He's not even posturing oh, that he has a decision. He's just explicitly telling it the is. field that he's that opening boxes and using time banks. And <laughs> Kempton here. <laughs> Let's open another box. I'll, I'll use the time extension. Because I play faster than all these guys, so I don't, I don't need all these. I'll use them, you know? You know, he, he does make a good point. He does play faster than the other guys in most situations. Uh, that's fair, but I, I, I think this is up. I, listen, I like Jared Blesnick. I have no problem. <laughs> I think this is over the line. This is a little bit over the Cause top. Because keep in mind, it's the 26-year-old's tournament life on the line. Right. And he's sitting there like, really, guys? Oh. Lamella. And he's showing this, this to Chidwick, really who card. couldn't care less. This is a really big card, Lamella, and he just he just signed him too. How much, Jared? How much is it worth? This card's worth like at least two thousand dollars. Really? Wow. Yeah. This is a really big card, rookie. All right, how many time extensions do I have? <laughs> I fold. I fold. Two. I'm not going to need all of them. It's okay. Yeah. Can I say something about both of you guys. Okay. You guys do not give a chip away. That's one thing I could say. But you guys are legitimately both robot human beings. Robot human beings. Okay. All right, we'll take that as a compliment. And he means this as a compliment, he does. I d okay. I think. I'm learning some stuff from you guys just being three-handed so long. They just don't give chips away. You guys right. are unbelievable talents, man, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Seriously. Is it like New York pizza? Huh? It's like New York pizza, or what is it? It is not New York pizza. We're in Las Vegas. Oh, this is... Really good. Really? What? This is the, the he is eating that pizza fast. Patch. Patch, get me a napkin. Yeah, get that man a napkin, please. I need a napkin. He needs a napkin. <laughs> Somebody get him a napkin. Get me a damn napkin. Somebody get him a napkin. A Give me a napkin. <laughs> yeah, he, he makes it fun, uh, but he also does make some pretty cool plays throughout this final table. Let's look at this next one that I found the most impressive. Super high roller bowl, pot limit Omaha, 100K event. We have been three-handed for quite some time. Chidwick with ace, king, king, deuce. Yep, very strong hand. Likely see him raise pot here against Bled, uh, Blesnick's limp. Although he may continue to play small ball. I think his hand's just a little too good. He does raise. It's 150. Yeah, it's right in the middle. Bloodstick's gonna call. So we'll see something going on here. Bloodstick in the small blind, Chedwick in the big blind. We now find ourselves three-handed, and Jared Blesnick has the commanding chip lead. He's in the small blind, and he decides to open limp. Now, in this tournament structure where there is a big blind ante that does not count towards the pot preflop, if you don't totally follow that, don't worry about it. It essentially incentivizes a lot of open limping from the small blind. That said, with a really big stack here and two smaller stacks uh, that you're up against, I think that going with an open raise strategy here and really applying pressure to the short stacks would make more sense. Jared made the final table. I didn't, so uh, let's, let's see how he handles it. Queen high flop, queen seven four. Blesnick with top two. Pot. And Blesnick just comes out and bets pot. Pot's right into Stevie, and an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable spot for Stevie here. He does have the over pair of kings. Um, we've used that word visibility. He does have somewhat bad visibility, although in this case he could turn a spade, which would give him additional outs to the nuts. Really hard to fold an over pair right now on such a disconnected board. 
Shedrick makes the call. We head to the Queen 7 4 rainbow flop, and this is a pretty good flop for Jared's range compared to Chidwick's range, mainly because Chidwick has a lot of high cards and high pairs, so he's not gonna flop a lot of two pair combos, he's not gonna flop a lot of pair plus straight draw on this board. Jared, with his actual hand, flops top two, and he decides to pot into Chidwick, which I think is totally fine. In a cash game situation, Chidwick has a very easy call here with Kings, but in this tournament spot, it's actually really close because he's either in bad shape, like we can see here, or he's very often up against a hand with between 35 to 55% equity against his ace-king-king, -king, and there's a lot of ICM pressure on him. And while Jared Blesnick may not care about ICM... I don't give two fucks about doing it. All the other players, I think, certainly do. Chidwick decides to make the call. I actually think it's really close, and he could consider folding this. If he didn't have the backdoor nut flush draw, I probably would make the fold. Total oh, wow, there's a king. Wow. I was, I was going to ask you, too. I go, what card does Chidwick want? And, well, there you go. Now, Blesnick in a really difficult spot here. And that is a card that he did not want to see. The SPR is just over one. I would not fault Blesnick for just betting the pot here, even though, as we can see, he's drawing dead. But he doesn't like this card, and you can see that on his face. Well, I mean... He got called. Now here it gets really interesting. The offsuit king rolls off on the turn, and they only have a pot size bet left. And this is a spot where the standard play is just to shove your chips in with queen seven and hope for the best. You're a favorite against the range that Chidwick called the flop with. You can make him fold a hand like aces, which has a decent amount of equity against you. You can make him fold some draws, or you can make him call with draws that you're behind. Plus, if you check, you can't really fold two pair. But uh, Jared makes the very non-standard play of checking to Stephen Chidwick. He was good. Right, and by the way, with the board being rainbow like this, I don't think Chidwick should be going for a pot size bet. I would bet something would you ever check smaller it back? here. Chidwick has an interesting decision here. He's got a pot size bet left, uh, and he has top set on a full rainbow board. There are some straight draws, but I think he's thinking, I don't want to just pot this in and make sure it fold a hand that's nearly drawing dead, which Jared actually has. does go with that small bet, 350000 I believe. I like this a lot from Chidwick, and what a difficult spot for Blesnick. So Chidwick sizes down to 350 k into a pot of almost $1.1 million. Jared now has a really interesting decision, because I don't think he should have checked in the first place, but now that he has checked, what does this size down from Chidwick mean? Chidwick is a very theoretically sound player. He really understands poker theory. He understands how to use a lot of different bet sizes, but he plays a lot more no limit than PLO. I don't really know, and I don't believe Jared knows how much short stack PLO experience Chidwick has, and if he's using this bet size as an exploit or you know, for the specific hand he has, or if it's just part of his game plan. If I were in this spot, I would be really curious. I would be nervous about running into a really big hand because if Chidwick had a hand like ace-ace-10, he probably just shoves it in. So when he's betting small, what does that mean? Jared has to decide if he wants to call and see a river with a very awkward stack to pot ratio and just guess on the river whether or not Chidwick's bluffing for his tournament life, to just shove it in now, deny some equity and the hand, not play the river out of position, or fold, which seems incredibly crazy, getting to the turn with one pot size bet. This could be just a world class if, if Blesnick's able to somehow sniff this out and get away from this. And yeah, he was very happy to play for stacks on the flop. Right. And I really don't think I'd be, you know, some of these cases I've said, you know, good fold when they were, when it would have been a correct call against the opponent's actual hand. I really think that Blesnick is properly sniffing this out. This is world class. This tuck, this is one of the best check folds I've ever seen. He weighs his options and decides to lay it down. And while I can say honestly that having gotten to this spot, I would seriously consider folding, I don't know if I would have been able to in the moment, and I wouldn't have checked in the first place. So Jared Blesnick finds the check fold with 0% equity in a spot where perhaps nobody else would have, which, hey, if you're gonna claim to be the best, these are the kind of plays you need to make. So where does Jared stack up against the best? Common opinion tends to be that he's not quite there. He's not one of the best in the world. However, he plays an unorthodox enough style and he plays infrequently enough that it's pretty hard to tell. And he comes into these tournaments and plays with the best in the world reasonably often and he's made some deep runs. In this tournament, he ends up heads up against Ike Haxton who is unanimously considered one of the best. Let's see how he fared. Haxton with a reasonably strong hand here given the situation. 
just decides to pot it. Lesnick has a double suited Drugal. I, I know, and I'm glad we got that in one more time at least. <laughs> the doubles, the the two suited Drugal. Yeah, for those of you just tuning in. How is this a Drugal? They're connected. Five three well, deuce. Well, but they're so low. Uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like we're. You we're could call that one a semi Drugal if you wanted. For okay. those of you just tuning in in the Halifax home games, a Drugal refers to a disjointed hand. Yeah, see, that's, that's or, I got five or, free or deuce. Or low cards, low cards, semi-disjointed. So I'm getting to the point now. So a Drugal basically is just a trash hand. It's a trash hand, yeah. Okay. This is a double-suited Drugal, or if, if you want to call it a double-suited semi-Drugal. More to the point, <laughs> we have Jared Blesnick potting into Ike Haxton, who has an overpair and a gut shot. I think all the chips are going to go in here, Tuck. They certainly could. Yeah. Ike's got just too much of a hand to fold, too many characteristics here. Backdoor flush draw, front door gut shot over pair of queens, and Blesnick, once he bets this size, despite only having a nine and a weak gut shot, he can't go anywhere. Two backdoor flush draws also worth mentioning for Jared Yeah, he, I mean, obviously, Blesnick doesn't know that his backdoor hard draw is no good. Um, he's got 43% equity, and if he can somehow get right. Haxton to fold, it's huge, but it's not going to happen. And Haxton the, is all in. There's the all in and the snap call from Blesnick. And if Haxton's queens hold, uh, he is going to basically be even with Blesnick. Right, and... Contrary to what we've seen in the past where the overpair was ahead but behind in equity, Haxton's overpair is also ahead in equity, but Blesnick not too far behind with 43%. Yeah, but is uh, Haxton at risk? 43% of the time, it'll be over. Blesnick, the outro on the top of your screen, a six, a nine, a five, a three, a deuce. Spade gives him some more outs. We'll see what happens on the turn. 5.6 million in there. Again, if Ike wins this. Yeah. They are even. There's a nine. Oh, and that's a huge that card. Haxton now drawing to just a queen or an eight. Only a queen or an eight will save Ike Haxton. Otherwise, Jared Blesnick is your super high roller bowl champion. It's the ace of diamonds. Jared Blesnick gets it done, and you can see the, the celebration there. Well played. You too. Jared, uh, for a few years now, you've been asking me when we're going to run a big Potlum at Omaha event. Uh, the inaugural Super High Roller Bowl Potlum at Omaha, you showed up for it. On behalf of Poker Go and Ari Resort and Casino, I'd like to present you with the Super High Roller Bowl Potlum at Omaha ring. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.